Good morning. Good morning. I'd like to welcome everyone to worship this morning as you ventured out on the icy highway. Um, and I'd like to thank Pastor Eric Matson for leading us in worship this morning, and he will also be with us next Sunday. And next Sunday, the Sunday school children will have their Sunday school Christmas program called Through Their Eyes. So I hope you come and see that. They put in a lot of hard work on that. And invite your family and friends. And we're going to have a breakfast brunch after the program. Uh, just a couple other announcements. Just be sure and read the schedule of events for this next week. The annual the annual meeting will be held on January 22nd. So any non-financial reports need to be turned in to me by January 9th. So if you, I sure would appreciate that. And I did post a letter on the bulletin board from Pastor Mark and Lois Dock, and there's a letter and pictures, so be sure and read that. And then Janice Gall had sent me an update last night regarding their family. Um, Derek is having surgery Friday to take out the dialysis apparatus that he's had for years to do his dialysis at home. And they're hoping um, by January 25th that his heart doctor in Yankton and Sioux Falls hope to get that he be back on the transplant list. And she indicated Ben has been struggling with pneumonia. And Riley is also having some health complications, so I did add him to the prayer list. And then she said they moved her mom, who is now 102 and a half, to the care center in Randolph, Nebraska. So that's closer for them, and they have the grandkids, I guess the great-grandkids around there to visit her. So does anyone have any other announcements? Okay, welcome to worship. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Sounds like you can hear me okay? Yes. All right, wonderful. It's great when it works the first time. <laughs> it's always a trick. Uh, so, yeah, I'm Pastor Aaron Madsen. Uh, I am the Companion Synod Coordinator and the Communications Director for the South Dakota Synod. I bring you greetings from Bishop Constanza Eggmeyer and the whole Synod staff. Uh, it's great to be with you as we journey in Christ together here in the South Dakota Synod. Now, as a Companion Synod Coordinator, just to explain, because not everybody is up on the churchy lingo, uh, I work with our Companion Synods in Nicaragua and Cameroon. I've been blessed to go to Nicaragua earlier this year. Hope to go to Cameroon sometime next year. Uh, if you're interested in the work that's going on there, some really great stories I can share with you. I'd love to do it, but so just so you know, that's that's a part of what I do. Another part is to, as a communications director, is I help share the word of what's going on. Uh, so uh, some of you might be subscribed to the Senate e newsletter that goes out every week. I put that together. And there's videos and the website and Facebook and all that fun stuff. That techie stuff that I feel like I'm hanging up by my fingernails to keep up with all the new stuff that's going on. Um, so, so that's what I do. If you'd like to talk more, happy to do so. Um, and last but not least, if I mess up, just wave at me or point me in the right direction, okay? <laughs> uh, but it's great to be with you today uh, on this beautiful Sunday morning. Uh, so now we'll let's let's begin now with the gathering litany that's in your bulletin for the third Sunday in Advent. We praise you, O God, for this victory wreath. Oh, please stand. As we light the candles on the wreath. Enlighten us with your grace. That we may serve our neighbors in need. Grant this through Christ our Lord. Whose time is servant and whose day draws near. Amen. Let's sing our hymn.
Let's now begin, uh, begin with a brief word of confession and forgiveness of Psalm 56. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and we cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for us, and for his sake forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ on by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. for above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who are here, their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Comfort and defend us, gracious Lord. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth.
Well, we're all human, so that's one thing. But we all need patience. <laughs> because doctors have patience. And we need patience. We need to be able to wait for things. Yeah. That's my dad joke for the day. <laughs> Even though I don't have any kids, it's just a dog. She does she kinda of looks at my jokes the way that, that she just did. Um, okay. So we all need patience. We all need to be able to wait for things, right? And I'm sure you are very good at being patient. Right? Okay, well good. Well good. When I was your age, I was not. I was not very patient. And my wife might tell you that I'm still not very patient now when I want something. Uh, but in this season of Advent, we're waiting for, right, waiting for Jesus' birth, which we celebrate at Christmas. So we're getting really close, right? Just a, like a week and a half or so to go. So that's exciting. I hope you're excited for that. Yeah, I am too. Um, but in the meantime, we know it's coming. We know it's going to be fun. But we still need patience right now to wait while it comes. And we're going to hear about how, in our gospel lesson, John the Baptist, he was getting a little impatient too. See, because some, a lot of the people that we meet in the Bible, they're just like us. Sometimes they get angry, sometimes they're sad, sometimes they're happy, sometimes they're not very patient. Actually, a lot of the times, a lot of the people in the Bible aren't very patient. And so they ask Jesus, or they ask God, when is what you promised going to happen? And God always says, basically, be patient, it's coming. And God always keeps God's promises. So even though it can seem like we have to wait an awful lot, God keeps God's promises. So we know that on December 24th, every year, is Christmas. We just need to wait for it. And we know that God's promised kingdom that's, that's coming someday is going to come and it's going to be even better than we can imagine. Even better than opening presents on Christmas Eve or Christmas morning, whatever you do. Uh, so, would you like to pray with me? Dear God, thank you for this young person. Thank you for all the young people that are involved in your church around the world. They are the church's future and they are the church's presence. Uh, we ask that you bless them and give them wisdom and give them, and all of us, patience to remember that you keep your promises always. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks for coming up. For today is from Isaiah 35, beginning with verse 1. The desert and the parched land will be glad. The wilderness will rejoice and blossom. Like the crocus, it will burst into bloom. It will rejoice greatly and shout for joy. The glory of Lebanon will be given to it. The splendor of Carmel and Sharon, they will see the glory of the Lord, the splendor of our God. Strengthen the feeble hands, steady the knees that give way. Say to those with fearful hearts, Be strong, do not fear. Your God will come. He will come with vengeance. With divine retribution, he will come to save you. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer and the mute tongue shout for joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand will become a pool, the thirsty ground bubbling springs. In the haunts where jackals once lay, grass and reeds and papyrus will grow, and a highway will be there. It will be called the Way of Holiness. It will be for those who walk on that way. The unclean will not journey on it. Wicked fools will not go about on it. No lion will be there, nor any ravenous beast. They will not be found there. But only the redeemed will walk there, and those the Lord has rescued will return. They will enter Zion with singing. Everlasting joy will crown their heads. 
Gladness and joy will overtake them, and sorrow and sighing will flee away. Here ends the reading. And the psalm for today is from Psalm 146, verses 5 through 10, and that's on page 287 in the LBW. We will read that responsibly by whole verse. Who made the heaven and earth, the seas, and all that is in them? Who keeps his promise forever? Who gives justice to those who are oppressed, and food to those who hunger? The Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord cares to the stranger. He sustains the orphan and widow, but the frustrates the way of the wicked. The Lord shall reign forever, your God, O Zion, throughout all generations. Hallelujah. And the second reading for today is from James 5, beginning with verse 7. Be patient, then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains. You, too, be patient and stand firm, because the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Brothers and sisters, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Here ends the reading. violin. 
from that case, placing the open case at his feet. He threw in a few dollars, which is a trick that street performers do. See, others gave, so why don't you give? So threw a few bucks in his case, and then he started to play as people walked by. And uh, it was right before 8 a.m. on a Friday in mid-January. It was the middle of the morning rush hour, so this is a good time. This is a prime time spot for a performer uh, to try to get some, get some money. For the next uh, 43 minutes, the Washington Post calculated, as the violinist performed six classical pieces of music, approximately 1,100 people walked by. Almost all of them on their way to work. If you have ever been in a big city like Washington, D.C., or Chicago, or even Minneapolis, you've seen something like this. Musicians of one type or another, playing some kind of instrument, some singing as well, setting up shop at a subway station, or in a public place like a park, um, with a case or a hat or something to collect whatever money they can. Some are surprisingly good and very talented, and some are not so much. Um, and you face this choice as you walk by, right? Do you stop and listen? Do you hurry past, pretend not to notice? Do you throw in some money out of politeness or maybe out of guilt? Does your answer change if, we, if the performer is good or not? These are all things you think in the moments you pass by. <coughs> uh, well, on that Friday in January, the answers of the individuals passing by would make the pages of the Washington Post. The reason is that no one knew it but the fiddler who was standing against that bare wall in the metro station uh, was actually one of the finest classical musicians in the world. Playing some of the most famous music ever written and one of the most valuable violins ever made. I have a friend who's an orchestra uh, teacher uh, I don't know much about myself, but even I have heard of Stradivarius. <laughs> it was a Stradivarius violin worth millions of dollars that that young man was playing that day uh, with the pieces. And it was, uh, this performance was arranged by the Washington Post as an experiment. Would people notice? Does it make a difference depending on the quality? You know, would the beauty of the music and the talent of the performer break through? in the hustle and bustle of daily life. Would anybody notice, right? Or was it just another guy out to make a few bucks? Uh, well, the violinist was one-time prodigy Joshua Bell, um, who had become an internationally acclaimed classical musician. And the story is on YouTube, if any of you uh, go on YouTube from time to time, you can look it up and even hear uh, there's a video of him playing. Um, so the day, three days before he appeared at a metro at this metro station in D.C., he had performed at a full house at Boston Symphony Hall, where some of the least expensive seats, the nosebleeds, sold for $100 a piece. But to the people on that metro station that January morning, he was just another street performer uh, trying to get some attention to his music. So in the hustle and bustle of these people's daily lives that day, I mean, you can't blame them, right? They're all on their way to work. They all have stuff going on in their lives. We don't know what. It's like we all have stuff I probably would have passed by too. Um, you know, they were all consumed by whatever cares and worries and stresses they all had. Um, these, but in that, being so kind of focused like that, they missed a world-class violin player in their midst. You don't often find a world-class musician in a subway station dressed like a panhandler, but that's how Joshua Bell appeared to the people in the subway that day. As pastor and theologian David Lose writes, much like those people didn't expect to see a world-class violin player on the subway, in Jesus' day there were quite a few people who didn't recognize him as the Messiah, the Son of God. The Messiah was supposed to be a powerful leader who would immediately make everything right in the world. People did not expect to see the Messiah as a wandering teacher 
traveling from town to town, healing and preaching of, and teaching, healing a few people at a time. People did not expect, most of all, to see the Messiah on a cross, dying and forsaken and rising again in three days. And we see in our story today from Matthew, just as I was talking about with the young lady before, John the Baptist was losing patience. Even he was confused. What was going on? Why has the world not made, been made right yet? So he asked a messenger to go to Jesus and ask a simple yet profound question. Are you the one? Or are we to wait for another? But as usual, when someone asks Jesus a question, Jesus does not give a straight answer. Be so much easier if he does it. But he doesn't. He never does. Instead, he gives a list to this messenger of what he's been up to. Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed. The dead hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have good news brought to them, and blessed is anyone who takes no offense in. This list comes straight from the book of Isaiah, including. For, for our first reading, you might have known, maybe, I hope, noticed some similarities in the book of so in our psalm reading, too. All the things Jesus was hearkening back to those old, old promises of what God is up to. So what's going on in Jesus, uh, John's question and Jesus' response? Well, according to one of my old seminary professors, Matt Skinner, what we're seeing from John isn't a lack of of imagination, but a lack of patience, restlessness. Sure, it's great that a few people have been healed. Wonderful for wonderful for them. Great. Um, but if you are the Messiah, the whole world is supposed to be fixed now. Not just a few people, but it, it all it all is supposed to be fixed now. So why am I, John, still in prison? Why are the Romans still oppressing us? <coughs> why isn't everything okay now? And John's expectations are frustrating. His needs to be patient. His, he, John is so eager to, to do this work. We notice in the story of John the Baptist, he was not a patient man ever. Right? So you can only imagine what he was like in prison, probably pacing up and down and not sleeping and just driving everybody crazy, including himself. You can't, so he's just impatient. What's going on? To be fair to John, though, I think a lot of us can relate. I know I can. Why is there still suffering in this world? Why is there still hungering? Why are those there still those who lack hearing, who are blind, who need their sight restored? Why are there still dead who need to be raised, poor who need good news brought to them? I, I thought of this question especially when I visited Nicaragua earlier this year. Wonderful, faithful, loving people who need to hear the good news, what's going on here? Why are they facing these conditions? I asked that a lot when I was there. But as uh, Dr. Skinner writes, Christianity, we spend a lot of time as Christians in Advent, in waiting. Uh, we are at a point where we are, we have some promises fulfilled and not quite fulfilled yet too. Uh, we're people who are aware of how in need of healing we are, our institutions, our human institutions are, our world is, and yet we know how resistant these institutions, this world, and even we can be to change, to healing, to God's love. But we don't believe that God leaves the world as it is. 
We never stop expecting new life, Skinner writes, to break into the scene. We all have work to do as Christian, that's our baptismal calling, but we know that the work that we do is God's work, our hands in the world, and it's a foretaste, a foretaste of the feast to come, as we sometimes say, right? communion is a foretaste of the feast to come. Skinner writes, when John's question, are we to wait for another, reaches Jesus, his response falls on ways that a new reality is breaking out in his ministry. John still remains locked up. There's still tyrants, still misers, not fleeing to the hills, but just as comfortable as ever. And a new age of righteousness has certainly not arrived. Nothing that grandiose. But Jesus' response points to deliverance taking place one person at a time. If Jesus were to name the specific people he has in mind when he speaks about those who were without sight, immobilized, deceased, deaf, and poor, John might have to confess that he has no idea who those people are. But the changed lives of the people known to Jesus show a new thing taking place. For now, John is just going to have to take Jesus' word for it. The Christian experience of perpetual, a lifelong advent means that we have to keep interpreting times and detecting signs of God's reign, lighting the way like small candles in a nighttime landscape. I think that's a wonderful imagery. All the little signs of God's kingdom breaking through in our world right now as we await the advent of Christ coming again are like little candles that shine the way in the darkness. Now, I've heard that, you know, in good South Dakota prairie land, you know, nice and flat. There's some hills around here, but, you know, they're in the prairie, nice and flat. You can see the light of one candle for up to a mile away on a clear night. That's how powerful light is. That's how powerful our light, light that Christ gives us to share, you know. Christ says we are the light of the world, so let your light shine. Or you might, to put it another way, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine, right? Let it shine, shine, shine. And that is something that we are encouraged to do in Advent. With all the candles around, it reminds us, we all, Christ, we are the light of the world, so we need to let our light shine to the world. Even though it might not seem any bigger than one little light shining in a great big darkness, that's what we're called to do. And when you get more than one light, when we all work together as a community in Christ, that's a whole lot of light, isn't it? So as we await the celebration of Christ's birth, who is the true light coming into the world? As we await the great celebration of his coming and the even greater celebration of when he comes again and finally sets the world fully and truly right, let us encourage one another and help one another see signs of God's inbreaking light in the world. And let us be that light. And let us encourage another to be that light with an inbreaking kingdom ourselves. As we work in our own ways to give sight to the blind, to help the deaf hear, and to bring good news to those in need. May each of us, as we go forth from this place, share the good news of the one whose arrival we wait and long for. And may the peace of God which passes all of our understanding keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus until he comes again. Amen.
3. Oh, please stand as you're able. We believe in one God, Father the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. As we prepare for the fullness of Christ's presence, let us pray for a world that longs and yearns for a new hope. Gracious God, we rejoice in the gifts of your Spirit. Equip us and all who worship you around the world to magnify your love and your peace in every land. We pray for the work of organizations like Lutheran World Federation and ELCA Global Mission. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Abundant God, we rejoice in your creation. We ask that you revive lands that have been squandered and depleted, that you make gardens flourish in cities and neighborhoods, that you cleanse our water and our air so that all living things may breathe and drink and praise you. In this winter season, in this part of the country, we ask that you keep us safe and, and those safe who are traveling uh, the coming hot weeks as we celebrate your birth. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Righteous God, we rejoice in your justice. We ask that you end discrimination and oppression that you deliver all who are unjustly imprisoned or persecuted, that you reconcile nations and people in conflict. Help us even to pray for our enemies as you would have us do. Lord, in your mercy. Your Healing God, we rejoice in your compassion. Comfort any in distress because of worry, illness, or loss, those who are suffering in mind, body, or spirit in any way. We lift up before you now Keva, Jean, Kitty, Clarice, Greg, Dustin, Ben, Derek, Riley, Betty, Beth, Jeanette, Kim, Celia, Gladys, Keith, Laura, Paul, Andrea, Cody, Wendy, Jenny, Tracy, Denise, Gannon, Tori, Paul, Diane, Ruth, Tom, Matt, Braden, Greg, John, Skylar, Trinity, Justin, John, Laura, Caitlin, Isabel, Micaiah, and Ann and Willie. Keep, uh, strengthen and, perfect and protect healthcare workers, rescue teams, crisis counselors, and all who risk themselves to keep each other safe. Lord, in your mercy. Hear prayer. Abiding God, we rejoice in your company. Give us calm and patient hearts as we gather with family and friends. Keep us mindful of those for whom this season is not happy. Console the grieving and surround them with loving support. Lord, in your mercy. Hear prayer. Faithful God, we rejoice with Mary, the mother of our Lord, and with all the saints, that your mercy endures for all generations. Look with favor on those who have died and lead us to joyfully sing of your everlasting promises. Lord, in your mercy. 
God of our longing, you know our deepest needs. By your spirit, gather our prayers and join them with the prayers of all your ch children. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The peace of our Lord be with you all. Let us share that peace with one another.
Please stand as you're able for the post communion blessing. Body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen.